Hello, um, so I'm Christopher Dady. Um, I'll be doing an intro to reverse engineering with uh, Ghidra. Uh, I like to call this talk uh, Taming the Dragon. Um, so first off, a little bit about me. Uh, I'm an avid CTF player. I've played in my uh, DEF CON uh, finals, um, qualified for other like uh, very large CTF events uh, with NASA rejects. Um, went to UTSA and enjoy doing crypto reverse engineering and like phone challenges for fun. Um, so let's do a little bit into like what is reverse engineering. Um, in this context, I'm talking purely software reverse engineering. There's another component where you do hardware reverse engineering. That's outside of the scope of what I'm going to talk about today. But uh, we'll talk about binary reverse engineering, generally taking some compiled code from the machine code. You lift it up to some form of an assembly language. And then from there, you can mess around with it. And you have tools that allow you to go up to higher uh, level languages. Uh, so it can be useful for figuring out how things work, from malware to CTFs. Uh, I do it a lot for vulnerability research and reverse engineering. Um, that's generally some of the things that you can use it for. Also, just like figuring out how something works or trying to debug a um, component of something. Um, so in reverse engineering, you generally have uh, the two common mindsets. You have static analysis and dynamic analysis. Um, for the purpose of this talk, we're primarily going to focus on static analysis with Deidre. Um, and from there, you're usually you're disassembling. So you're taking that bytecode, that machine code, you then lift it to an assembly. And then you have a, another step with Deidre and Ida called a decompilation step, which will take their um, assembly it to some type of an IL. So with uh, Ghidra, you'd be going slay to P code. And then from there, it goes to like a C-like syntax. Um, so the process of static analysis is examining code without executing the program. Um, and this provides an understanding of code structure and program flow, but it is limited, right? So you're going to lose a lot of contextual understanding from like relative jumps from uh, registers that you're not able to probe without um, having like a dynamic uh, system. You won't know which branching paths you go down unless you actually run it. And so while static analysis can be limited, it is still a very useful and very necessary trait for the uh, reverse engineering toolkit. Uh, dynamic analysis is usually you execute the binary through some form of execution, usually uh, in the reverse engineering uh, spectrum, you have some type of debugger attached to it. And I believe these go hand in hand with static analysis because you can uh, utilize what you're learning from both ends to see which paths you want to go down in the dynamic side or what values or what things you want to set when uh, reversing and getting your understanding from the static analysis side. Uh, oh, this node is actually outdated. Um, they just recently in the beta for uh, Deidre 10 added the uh, debugger, and I do have a slide talking about that. Um, the debugger is actually pretty interesting. It reminds me of uh, RetSync, which was a tool for IDA that would allow you to like integrate with like uh, WinDebug and some other things. Um, the next thing that I'd like to talk about though is like a plan of attack. So. Generally, when you are reversing some type of binary, you have to start somewhere. So I know some people do a top-down approach. So they'll start from the like program entry and work all the way down through it and try to like uh, document up anything that they see or like fix anything up that they see while scrolling down through the uh, assembly. This can be very difficult for people new to uh, reverse engineering because you get lost in the weeds here and may not always be necessary. Um, depending on what type of reversion you're trying to do. Uh, you can do it at a high level, so um, looking at the different function entries and then go from there and skim the functions to identify common ones. Uh, you can go from common system calls and function calls and then trace the program to find interesting things. This is a very like common tactic used with like vulnerability research in that you want to spend as little time as possible reversing the entirety of the program. You want to find where you have 
um, input coming from the user or coming from over the socket or whatever controlled input that you may have in order to see what types of things you can um, mess with and so on. So that's very common for that. And then guided usually um, is like if you have dynamic analysis. So you can trace the execution flow from dynamic side and then use that to see the paths that you take. And that one I think is probably the easiest for beginners to get a um, understanding of because you have something that's already ran through and executed the binary and so you can kind of step through that trace and figure out what's going on there. Uh, some common pitfalls in reverse engineering is going too deep into the rabbit hole. Um, you can have a ton of different like uh, functions that do like very complex things but those complex things may not be uh, what you're interested in. This happens a lot in debugging where people will initially get lost in some of the like sysfalls or so on, start debugging code that's a little bit lower than what they actually want to be executing in. Um, you could also get into a pitfall of reversing functions that aren't reachable. This happens a lot in static analysis where um, you don't know whether or not that code is going to be reachable for what you're doing. It may be like a very um, unused section that like only gets hit with like different startup parameters and so on. So uh, it can be hard to know what to reverse, but you can also get stuck reversing functions that um, aren't very useful. Um, running into decompile or like disassembly issues. So. That's something that can be very frustrating. Um, and I run into that with Yijo, like either the function is too large or the function has like very strange things that causes the decompilers to quit out. And same thing where the disassembly kind of just doesn't track the uh, function. You have to fix it up in order for anything to actually uh, be analyzed. And the not saving your database is a common pitfall because I've had power outages, I've had other things where um, not having a save of your database can throw a lot of work and research time out the window. Um, so a simple overview of what a disassembler or like Ghidra does is it'll convert uh, machine code up to assembly, uh, recognize the start and end of functions, recognize jump calls to functions, uh, it'll help you find strings and like uh, data sections. Uh, it'll remember like any user labels and comments, so you can type in your own comments to start to make a uh, like binary that you're versing more readable, more understandable, and generally has a graph of program flow. All right, so I've been talking about Ghidra a lot, but what is Ghidra? So it's a software reverse engineering tool with version management and decompilers and also now includes a debugger. Um, it has a public repo on GitHub with active contributions and maintainers, and it is multi-platform. So I'm using it today on OS X, but it's uh, going to run on Linux, OS X, Windows, or any type of environment that has uh, Java 11 supported. Uh, as to the supported architecture, so this is a uh, list from Rob Joyce. Uh, Rob was one of the like initial people who spearheaded um, publicizing Ghidra and also um, was the main face in promoting Ghidra. Um, but they have all sorts of different uh, supported architectures, and these supported architectures generally have an associated uh, decompiler. And this is very nice because for a lot of these architectures, tools like IDA um, did not have uh, a way to lift them without doing um, either your own custom lifting of it or having to finagle it in some other way. So this definitely improved reverse engineering overall and has made uh, life a lot easier for people working in um, some of these various architectures. Um, one second. Yeah, so to download Ghidra, so there are two websites. There's the uh, NSA's um, Ghidra 
uh, repo on GitHub, and then there's teacher.sre.org. Um, right now, you have the stable version, which I believe is 9.2.4, and then the beta version, which is 10.0. And the beta version is what I'm going to be doing for some of my um, uh, demos at the end of the presentation. Uh, so, like the general like understanding of the layout, you have um, things broken down into different areas. You have uh, docs, which have cheat sheets, which have presentations to like get yourself or get you um, acclimated to like some of the minutia of Deidre. Um But for running it, you have Deidre Run and Deidre Run .bat. So Deidre Run is going to be the Linux utility or OSX utility. It's a Bash script that um, opens the uh, Java. And then same thing with the uh, bad script, which will run on Windows. Um, the trainings are really interesting. Uh, they have instructor notes to give your, uh, to like um, be more familiar with the content that's going on in the presentation. So they can be a really good learning environment. Um, I looked through the beta today and I didn't see anything in the advanced or intermediate that had uh, presentations or documentation there on the debugger. So the debugger is still uh, reading some of the other documentation and kind of figuring it out on your own right now. Um, some useful plugins that I think are pretty cool for uh, Deidre right now are Dragon Dance. So it's like Lighthouse for Deidre. Uh, Lighthouse um, is a tool that would take like dynamic traces of the uh, binary and then use that to visualize and manipulate the code coverage that you get when executing. So it'll like highlight the different fields or basic blocks that you see to um, kind of get an understanding of where you've progressed in the binary at a dynamic side and replicate that over on the static side. Um, this just has a, uh, it's a digital community page and it has a uh, ton of plugins and CPU, other like CPU extensions that may not be uh, directly supported by Deidre, but um, community support have uh, created. So I think there are some for like the uh, like Game Boy and so on that are up there. And then there's uh, Daenerys, which allows for execution of IDA scripts and Deidre and also allows you to port your DJ scripts over to IDA, which has been really nice. Uh, one thing not listed here is that um, Deidre also has tools to convert your binary database from IDA to Deidre and from Deidre to IDA, noting that you will lose some of the comments and markups that you have, but some of the structure, like if you have to manipulate the like program entry or if you have different like uh, header sections that you have to uh, mess with, like if you're doing firmware, those things will be uh, saved and propagated into the other analysis tool. Uh, so some useful features, um, so themes and configurations. Um, you can see here that I have like a little um, dark mode like, so it's using the metal theme and then inverts the colors to make it look like dark mode. Um, I was going to use this for some of my demos. However, I believe it makes it a little bit unreadable for like presentation wise. So I'm going to probably just use the light mode theme. Um, there's version tracking. So the version tracking in the um, Deidre server, and that's probably one of the most powerful things with Deidre apart from having um, lifters and decompilers for architectures that other um, tools don't support is the um, server collaboration. So I believe for IDA, like RPI sec, I'd say um, CTF team uh, out of the uh, school RPI up in New York, um, they have their own developed system to do collaboration in IDA, but they never released it and never publicized it. Um, so barring that, there's no like collaborative way to do reversing other than uh, everybody's just sharing their um, databases across with, um, each other. So it was really difficult to manage who did what and also um, transferring those changes was a bit tedious. So Deidre uh, comes support it with a Deidre server, which you can set up and then you can commit up your analysis changes to um, the server to allow other people to view that and also 
um, commit their own changes. So it's very good as a teaching tool. Um, I think it is stellar to use in like the university uh, sphere um, and is also very good for collaborative, large reversing efforts on uh, either like large uh, binaries or things that are very complex that have multiple engineers working on them. Um, it has binary diffing, however, um, I still prefer Bindiff, which Bindiff, um, I believe, has some support for um, Deidre now, but I know it has support for Ida. Bindiff is a uh, utility that will um, diff two separate binaries. So if you have like a newer version, so say Windows came out with a patch for something, you want to figure out what that patch has, you can use the binary diffing to um, view the difference between that. Um, I haven't been the biggest fan of the Ghidra provided binary diffing tool, but it still is nice uh, as a nice to have. And Modi is something that I'll show you in uh, while doing the demo. Um, so I kind of ranted a bit about um, the server uh, collaboration, but it's actually like really easy to set up. Um, you basically just need a centralized server and then it's running out of the same um, utilities that you run for like each run. So you just have a server component, it runs um, that stuff, just needs Java um, set up and you can easily get the server running there and then have other people be able to access that. Um, I thought about having a Vija server that people could uh, use and uh, play with during the talk. However, um, Yidra has like authentication and there is an un unauthenticated mode, but I didn't necessarily want to do that because then people could like mess things up. So I decided to mix that idea. But um, the server collaboration is very uh, useful for lots of different things. Uh, so you can track like commit changes, kind of similar to like using GitHub for changes to uh, reversing engineering a binary. Um, you can review changes by others and you can see that version history and revert back to those changes. And it's very useful for CTFs where you're um, doing things very like quickly and need to share those uh, binaries very quickly. So you can have people like reversing different functions and then collaborate to see where they are on different things. Very useful for mentoring and group malware reversing efforts, group vulnerability researching efforts, and so on. Um, so when you first start off with uh, Deidre, you're going to have like, um, you're going to start it up and you're going to get this type of view. So you have like a tool chest uh, and you don't have an active project. So you need to create a new project. Um, and with that new project, so you create projects, you can create a shared or unshared project. Shared projects are going to be pushed up to a server if you have a server. Um, from there, once you create a project, my project is called test, um, then you can then start to upload your binary. So for this example, I'm uploading or importing um, my OSX LS um, binary up into Ghidra to try to reverse engineer that. Um, once you have a binary that's imported, you'll double click the binary. Um, it'll pop up with a, a few different um, window panes, but then it'll ask you saying, hey, this binary hasn't been analyzed. Would you like to analyze it? And you'll have a bunch of different settings. If you're just starting off with Ghidra, I would say probably don't mess with the different um, analyzers. I would like look through them and like some of them might be useful for like the different niche things that you're working with. Um, so for instance, like, uh, I know there are some plugins for analysis for like Game Boy and so on. So you might want to like use those strips, but maybe run them as one-offs rather than run it in like the batch mode of like running all of these scripts at one time. Um, tool options. So, uh, with Hydra, you can modify the tool to do a bunch of different things You can change the color scheme and you can also change um how different things like lay out on the tool so for instance uh one thing that i like to modify when i'm using ghidra is um, usually eliminate unreachable code is checked um 
as I do a lot of vulnerability research, and it might be nice for once you have a bug to know uh, what different chains or like um, code that you can utilize to execute in other areas. So um, while I may uh, think that it's unreachable, you may be able to make it unreachable. So I like to, or you may be able to make it reachable. So I like to uh, uncheck that field. Um, it adds a little bit more to what you're going to see with Hedra and this can sometimes lead you back into that rabbit hole of reversing things that aren't reachable, but I generally would rather see it than not um, from my perspective. Um, you can also go through and modify your key bindings. Um, I like to fix up some of the key bindings to make them similar to IDA, just because that's what I'm more used to and accustomed to when doing reversing. Um, and also just adding other um, like key bindings to make thing, like your life easier for different um, tools that you have, or like the different components and different views that you have in Deidre. Uh Another thing that I like to disable, and this is really hard to read and why I decided not to do um, the dark mode from here, but you can see like the checkboxes really aren't usable, but um, for the disassembly options, I like to turn off um, markup inferred variable references. And so what this is doing is saying, if you have a variable that's named in the decompilation side, so in the C side, it tries to assign the registers over on the uh, disassembly those same names. And for my purposes, that generally is more confusing than helpful. I like to be able to see what registers are being used, especially with um, the different parameters and like uh, stuff for function, um, like collie collar conventions. So I prefer to like actually be able to see the um, registers there. And I'll show you an example of that in a second. Um, there's also some common key bindings that you can look at. And after I finish this talk, I'm going to go through and upload my slides and um, some test binaries for people to mess with if they're interested. Um, but there's like several uh, different common key bindings. There's actually um, several gist out there of like applying um, all of like Ida's um, tooling interface, so like the key command, key bindings for that over to Deidre to make your um, transition a little bit easier. Um, now we're gonna talk about some of the views. So there's the graph view. Um, it is my perspective that the graph view for Deidre is not my favorite. Um, if I were to work on something only from a graph view perspective, I believe Ida is far superior in that, and Binary Ninja is far superior in the view that you get for graph view. Um, I just feel like Deidre's is a little bit clunky, um, but you know, Deidre makes up for it, and how its general workflow is intended to be used is more from the decompilation than from the graph view. Um, but with the graph, you can apply markup, so you can apply coloring. Um, this is very useful when doing like traces, so you can um, uh, colorify things in the graph to say, hey, we took this branch, we went down this code path, and so on, so it can make your life a little bit easier um, with where which um, functions you've either gone down dynamically or which functions you've reversed and or which portions of the function you reverse and which portions you haven't. Um, now the decompiler, I'd say the decompiler is the like bread and butter and what most people end up using when using um, Deidre. Um, I like to think of it as like a cheat mode in a sense. So I'm very used to using um, Ida to go through the uh, disassembly and having to read a lot of the assembly to understand things. So having a decompiler is definitely nice and um, is definitely an aid in which you can comment up all of these different variables, add your own um, mnemonics names in order to um, make it more understandable and more readable for uh, your reverse engineering needs. 
this is an example of uh, doing the markup. So this is just a min copy. You have your dust, your source, and then the size. Um, so yeah. Uh, you can also patch a binary. So um, say that you have, I don't know, my um, example for this that applies to most people is say that you uh, like want to cheat in a video game or you want to like apply a patch to software because it's being annoying or something. You can apply patches to like say not take a jump or so on. So it does have the ability to patch a binary and type in the uh, various instructions that you'd want to add there, and it'll fix it up and write that machine code for you. But then you having to like manually like set it the binary. Uh, now we'll talk a little bit about P-code. So Slay and P-code are some of the intermediate views and intermediate languages that Ghidra uses taking the um, microcode, the machine code, popping it up to an assembly, and then from there, popping it up to C. So it'll go through these IL, or intermediate uh, language, or in intermediate representation uh, views before being pushed up to that C-like syntax. Um, you can also go in, uh, and I'll show it in a second, but you can enable P-code so that you can see what the P-code is for the, um, given function you're looking at. And an understanding of the P code is very useful because you'll be using that a lot if you're doing any scripting or automation with uh, Deidre. Um, then you have the script manager. So um, this is just like all the different scripts that are already available. But if you add in any of your own scripts or what I like to do generally is go in and edit one of these scripts that has some of what I need, but not all of it. I'll create a new one, copy it off that, and then uh, edit that to do um, what I'm looking to do. But um, these can, it can be nice to like go through here and see if there are any scripts that might be useful for the reversing case that you're using. Um, definitely more of a power user than a very basic user type functionality. Um, next is the data type editing structure. So, um, I think this is probably one of the more like stronger use cases for Ditra and applying it to the decompilation. So you can have these like very large like C-like structures that have tons of data um, in them, and you can create those structures and edit those structures in Ditra, and then apply that to what you're seeing in the um, binary so that Ghidra recognizes that and is able to say, ah, yes, this is this structure, these are how they're referencing it, and so on, just to like pretty up the um, decompilation and make it look nicer. But also to, um, you can apply this across all uh, functions so that uh, it tracks and traces uh, to know like what this um, type of the um thing might be um that's another thing is just in the data type editing um you can if you know there are custom types for the structure so say it's some um, well-known um i triple e standard and you're reversing that and you see these structures that relate to those things you can start to apply those structures and those data types and then um apply that across the binary in order to have a greater understanding of what's going on uh, I think this is like a very powerful um, side of what that makes the like, feature very useful. And then we'll talk about the debugging side. So debugging is still in beta. Um, I believe they're planning to release uh, Ghidra 10 sometime this month, either like mid to late this month. Um, so then I think you'll get more documentation and maybe have some presentation slides uh, with an introduction to the um debugger but the debugger is very similar in my opinion to uh like red Saint. so it allows you to integrate in with like wind debug or allows you to integrate in with gdb in order to have some type of uh, debugging um uh, like native debugging um uh, capabilities with um the binary that you're using some of the interesting things though that they've added or um they added like time travel 
as debugging through emulation to say, um, I want to step back through what I was just executing. Um, and it allows you to do that through keeping track and state of the registers. Um, noting that time travel debugging is not flawless. Um, so that is to say that there are some things that may be lost. So like, uh, let's say that you are modifying files or you have mutexes or you have locks. Um, it may change state when trying to go back through things um, and so on, if, or those things may not like be properly set. So um, the timeless slide debugging isn't perfect, but it is still very interesting and useful uh, functionality and definitely something like really neat that I thought they added. Um, also, just like having the stack and like the ability to trace and like set watch points within Deidre and then also have the um, disassembly and also decompilation available is like really neat and useful. Um, I won't be showing a uh, demo of the debugging side of things today, but um, it is something that I plan to use more and work with more. Um, they, it's my somewhat recent in release, um, but yeah. Cool, demo time. So I have um, Deidre already open. Um, I'm gonna create a new project just to show you the workflow, but um so you can create a non-shared project or a shared project so non-shared being local shared project meaning you're going to need to have a Deja server running um that you can connect in with um otherwise you're going to create a non-shared project so that's what we do here let's get this to these sides and finish and let's see another all right, so now we have a project, right? But we don't have any binaries added in here yet. So there are two ways that you can add in binaries. You can either add them in through hitting I, uh, which is import. Uh, you can also do file, import file. Uh, you can also like um, go through and drag and drop. So say I have a program over here. Uh, you can drag it in and see what type of um, File it is so this particular file is the uh, MIPS um, Bayesian Indian 32 bit uh, binary uh, in the form of an ELF. Uh, so we can go ahead and import that. And so what it's doing here is just loading that binary into the uh, system. It's not doing any of the analysis just yet. Um, you can do similar things. So one sec here, while it processes this. And certain things are going to be a little bit slower than others. So, um, for instance, this is MIPS. It's going to take a little bit longer than, say, your x86 or x64, um, and so on. Uh, I found that like analyzing Dalvik or like any APKs is like very time intensive. So I'll show you how to import the uh, APKs, but I won't go through actually analyzing them because it takes a very long time. But here we can see, um, so I'll prompt you with, uh, do you want to analyze the binary? We'll say yes. And then we'll just go through with the general um, things. Sorry, I can't really tell if this is readable. So if the speaker wants to pop up then I'm sorry, if the uh, other, anyone wants to pop up and say it's not readable, let me know. Um, I'm used to doing this on like a large projector. Yeah, so while it goes through the analysis, I'll kind of talk through the different components. So you have your program tree here, um, which talks about your different sections of the uh, program. So you have your like global offset table here, your DSS, your S data you should have your data, your um, text section, and so on. Um, over here, you have your symbol tree. So this will talk about your imports. So this will show all of the different 
um, imports that you have. So what are the windows for Linux? This is a Linux binary, it's an elf. Um, so it's gonna have like libc.so and then it's doing some crypto here. Um, and then it's a, it has like standard C++ library as well. Um, we can see what functions are exported. So this would be useful if you're looking at like a DLL or like a, um, some type of shared object, because um, then you have a lot of like uh, program exports. But um, generally speaking, for the types of binaries that you might be reverse engineering, especially when you're a beginner, you may not be looking at those shared objects or those DLLs. So um, you're going to be looking more at the functions tab. Um, one thing that's interesting, let's try to bring this out a little bit, is that. Um, Ghidra will kind of take full, uh, like your functions and like apply them in the files for things that are similar, uh, which I think is interesting, but not always like nice um, for some of the uh, things that I want to like look at. But um, you can see these are all your like different sys calls or like function calls here. Uh, you can see these are all your like unnamed functions, and then you can see some of the other different things. Um, so generally, you're gonna look for your main. Um, if it's a script binary, it might be underscore underscore libc start main um, or entry or so on. So depending on like the type. Uh, binary, you're going to have different like program entries, but this one has a defined main um, that we can look at and see like over here. So this side we have the this assembly, um, so you can see the different um, components. And if you open this tab here, so this shows all of the different sections. Um, and right now you can see I have highlighted the operands. Um, over here, you can see the bytes. Here, you can see the mnemonic, and then so on. Um, so, if you wanted to like enable um, P code, you can enable that and you can see what the P code looks like for the, all of the different instructions over here. But it does add a lot of bloat. Yeah, so, we'll go ahead and disable that field. Uh, and then we also want like post comment and EOL comments. Um, EOL comments, like adding comments in here are very nice when you're reversing to say, hey, I figured out what this does or what this is doing and so on. And then over here, you can do the same thing. So now you're, um, I'm going through the uh, decompilation. So you can see this is a function call that has uh, two parameters I can label one of the parameters to be a new name, and it'll um, replicate across here. Um, another thing that I kind of wanted to show were the tool options. So when you go into the tool options, you have a ton of different options. Um, I don't know how to say, like, go to here if you want to, like, do these things. It's like, it's so varied. But if we go back to um, this little view right here, if you highlight like the different sections and see that this gets highlighted, so like ah okay, it's in the operands field that I want to like uh, look at something. So go to listing fields, and that'll be all of the uh, different fields for here. And then you can go to operands field, and this is the um, thing that I was mentioning turning off before was the markup inferred variable references. Um, I prefer to see the um, different like uh, registers rather than the um, pseudonames that Ghidra automatically applies or that I may apply when looking at the disassembly. Um, other things that are interesting, so the function called um, graph, so this or function called tree. Um, just to see like what um, incoming and outcoming calls go to these. It'd be nice to see like track your way up or track your way down for different things. Um, this button right here is how you open the script manager. And so we can do all the different scripts. Uh, and then window, um, you want to see the function graph. 
see it. Um, and then here you can like scroll around and so on. Um, I still think, so I use, I'm using a laptop right now, using a touchpad, um, but for Ghidra, I still think that you need a um, mouse in order to like use it uh, correctly, just by virtue of like, if you want to um, say highlight all uses of a variable in the uh, assembly or highlight all uses of a um, register or something like that in the assembly you have to middle click you can rebind that in the key bindings but i believe it uh, generally for their purposes is assumed that you have um, a mouse um, so for this instance we're not going to save for your instances you may want to save it um, and then i'll show you also opening a uh, apk so import we have this little like uh, hello world apk it's literally the simplest apk that you want so you have different ways that you can uh, open it you can open it as a single file that's not going to work batched not going to work either or as a file system so i like to open it as a file system and then you can browse it to see ah uh, here's the uh, dex that i want to analyze it so then you can open this and then import that dex then you can import it as a single file you see that it's a uh, dalvik executable so this is just the java bytecode um and then go through and import that i would go through and do it but it takes a very long time to do those things so um and i'm running kind of light on time so i'm gonna quit the demo now and kind of go into my mean section um for those of you who may have seen one of my presentations before know me i always have memes in my slides so these are some of my favorite ones related to Ghidra. um basically when Ghidra was released uh, there was a lot of like back and forth between ida and Ghidra. like Ghidra cost somewhere in the range of like three grand to like 15 grand if you're looking for like all versions and all different types of things um and so on so i'll just like leave the memes up for a bit. Uh, this is probably my favorite one from the Babadook of uh, kind of making fun of Radari users, uh, unfortunately. Hello, I'm Philip Wiley, the founder of the Pwn School Project. Pwn School Project was founded in June 2018 as a way to offer free education based on penetration testing and ethical meetings back in 2018. Uh, Hello, I'm Philip Wiley, the founder of the Pwn School Project. The Pwn School Project was founded in June 2018 as a way to offer free education based on penetration testing and ethical hacking to the, the public, more specifically the Dallas-Fort Worth area. Uh, this was created out of my passion to educate others. When I was, uh, before I started teaching, I did a lot of mentoring, which kind of inspired me to go into teaching. And you know, I was teaching ethical hacking at Dallas College. And some of my students towards the end of the semester, the first semester was asking, what, where could they take more classes? Because they're interested in taking it, but most people had you know, a small budget for training. So my idea was to get together like on the weekends and, and do some, some little workshops, some little hands-on training to help them further their education so I decided to go a step further and started the Pwn School Project, or Pwn School for short. Uh, the Pwn School Project hosts two meetings per month. They started out physical meetings back in 2018. Uh, 2019, I started 
offering the Dallas meeting streamed so that way it opened up to people around the globe to be able to consume this content and help them. And when the pandemic hit, we ended up going uh, virtual with both of the meetings, offering two meetings per month. And we expanded past offensive security into defensive security. Even we had talks on uh, becoming a, a CISO as well as talks on uh, becoming a SOC analyst. Another thing unique to Pwn School is at least far is the area that, that I live in where Pwn School is founded in the Dallas Fort Worth area is this, this meetup was more friendly to new, new people trying to get into the industry. And we tried to take more of an educational approach. So not only does Pwn School stream uh, monthly meetings, I also teach pen testing and web app pen testing workshops at different conferences for different colleges and for different uh, cybersecurity groups. So if you're interested in checking us out, uh, go to pwnschool.com and there's a link to our Slack channel as well as meet up for our scheduled meetings. And I hope to see you at a Pwn School meeting sometime soon. Thanks.